आप ऑर्डर वन कर देंगे ठीक है यस यस व्यक्तम आत्मवता आत्मा भगवान आत्म भावन स्वाना अनुग्रह सिद्धरूपी चरत चरत या जगह The supreme personality of Godhead is always anxious to elevate the living entities who are his part and parcel, and for the special benefit, the Lord travels all over the world in the form of self-realized persons like you. Is Holy Nath Bhakti Bina Nasma Maharaj ki? Jai. Kunja Bihari.
पवित्रमीह विद्य योग transcendental knowledge we do so in terms of spiritual understanding as such there is nothing so sublime and pure as transcendental knowledge ignorance is the cause of our bondage and knowledge is the cause of our liberation this knowledge is a mature fruit of devotional service and when one is situated in transcendental knowledge, he need not search for peace elsewhere, for he enjoys peace within himself. In other words, this knowledge and peace culminate in Krishna consciousness. That is the last word in the Bhagavad Gita. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Yanam Jana Shakya Chasuri Lipinasya Asmai Shri Gurave Nama Shri Chaitanya Mahobhisham Stati Tamye Abhutare Sri Nurupa Dhamayam Tadadi Svarantipam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yata Shri Guru Vaishnavansya, Shri Guru Vansakratatam, Sahagana Raghunatam, Vitam Tam Sajivam, Sarvaitam Sarvadutam, Parijana Sahitam, Krishna Chaitanya Devam, Shri Arata Krishna Padam, Sahagana Adita Shri Vishakani Vamsya, Hare Krishna Karana Sindhu, Dina Vandu Jagatpade, Gopesha Gopita Kanta, Radha Kanta Namospade, Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi, Radhe Vrindavane 
chapter is entitled Transcendental Knowledge. This final section in the fourth chapter, Lord Krishna is reve revealing to us the glories of Transcendental Knowledge. Previously, Lord Krishna had been speaking about Karma Yoga, and Karma Yoga leads to Jnana Yoga. Jnana Yoga is getting more knowledge, more understanding. We can see the progress in the Bhagavad Gita. How Krishna is going through the different levels of the yoga ladder. From Karma Kanda to Karma Yoga, and then from Karma Yoga to Jnana Yoga. And with proper knowledge, then Lord Krishna will explain in the sixth chapter, Dhyana Yoga, meditation. And the goal of that meditation is to bring one to devotional service. So we should understand it's not required that we have to go through all the different levels of the yoga ladder in order to come to bhakti yoga. We can immediately take up the process of bhakti yoga. Just like coming into this building, we didn't walk up the stairs. We take the elevator, right? And similarly, we immediately take up the practices of bhakti yoga. And from bhakti yoga, we automatically acquire all the preliminary qualifications. This has been described in Srimad Bhagavatam, in the first canto, second chapter, where the Sutta Goswami is describing the, the whole process of devotional service. And he has mentioned there, Vasudeva Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Priyojata Jnana Yati Asu Vairagyam Jnanam Chayadahi Tukam. By the application of devotional service to Lord Vasudeva, one automatically acquires causeless knowledge and detachment from the world. Jnan and Vairag, these two things follow wherever there is devotion. So in this verse, uh, Lord Krishna has described the mature fruit of devotional service, right? The mature fruit, uh, the mature fruit of all mysticism. Such knowledge is the fruit of all mysticism. When we have actually practiced, when our devotional service is mature, the, the results will be there, that we will have proper realization, transcendental knowledge will be there in the heart. It will be given by the grace of Krishna. Krishna describes in Chatur Sloki Bhagavad Gita, right? To those who are constantly devoted to me and worship me with love, I give the understanding by which they may come to me. Out of compassion, I, dwelling in their hearts, destroy the darkness born of ignorance with the lamp of knowledge. So Krishna himself acts on the heart of the devotee to guide them, to give them transcendental knowledge, to reveal to them the nature of the truth. Transcendental knowledge was described in verse 34. How we get this transcendental knowledge? We have to approach the spiritual teacher. The process was given. How you get that knowledge? You have, we have to submit ourselves. We have to inquire. <laughs> we have to render service. Then the spiritual teacher can reveal the truth. And what that truth is was then explained in the next verse. Lord Krishna describes 
one who knows that truth, will know that everything is in me and it's in my, and it's mine. So that is the proper understanding. That nothing is actually ours, but everything belongs to Krishna. And we are also His. And we are meant for His service. But the, the real power of transcendental knowledge is given in the next verse, where Lord Krishna describes it, even the sinful person, that if he is situated on the boat of transcendental knowledge, he can cross over the ocean of material existence. Lord Krishna gives special attention to one who has cultivated this transcendental knowledge. But we should understand this transcendental knowledge is not an easy thing to, to acquire. Uh, it, the knowledge must be mature. Lord Krishna mentions also, he gives the example, say, just like a blazing fire can burn wood to ashes, similarly uh, transcendental knowledge can burn to ashes, the reactions of all of our past activities. We should understand, Krishna has mentioned, the blazing fire. In other words, our knowledge also has to be like a blazing fire. It can't be weak. Our faith must be strong. We must have full conviction in the glories of the Lord and in the power of that transcendental knowledge. There are different degrees of devotees. We know there's the, the neophyte devotee, which is termed kanista. There is the intermediate devotee on Madhyam, and there is the topmost devotee, the Uttama devotee. They are classified in these different ways according to their knowledge as well as their faith. On the topmost level, one has both knowledge and faith. But on the lesser level, the faith and the, the neophyte devotee, the Kinista, faith is weak. Knowledge is not there. Not much knowledge is there. So therefore, his faith can easily be broken. We all have to cultivate that knowledge. How do we do it? We have to hear. We have to hear until we that, that, that knowledge will become mature, it will become realized within us. It's not just simply hearing like the, the bird hears, like a parrot may hear. There's a story about one Brahmana, he became a parrot in his next life. He was a Brahmana, but he was proud of his knowledge. He had knowledge, but he had no understanding, he had no realization of that knowledge. And he was constantly criticizing a, a prostitute woman. And the result was, at the time of death, he thought of that woman. And he was put into the body of a parent. Just simply criticizing others. So, we have to be careful. Not just simply re repeating knowledge. But there must be some proper realization, proper understanding. That is called Vigyan. So there is Gyan and Vigyan. Both are qualities of the Brahmana. The Brahmana not only has knowledge, but he has also realization of that knowledge. He knows how to apply it. We have to under understand how to apply religious principles according to time and circumstances. If one is simply a dictator, one may, may make a vow to be very truthful, not to tell a lie. But in certain circumstances, one may, have, one may be advised to tell lies. Just like the, the story in the Mahabharata is given there, that, uh, that some village people were running away from some dacoits, and they went to hide in a neighboring forest, and they were seen by one man. This man had made a vow not to tell a lie. So when the Dakois came, they asked him, where did all those village people go? So he told them that, oh, they've gone in there, they're hiding in the forest. So the Dakois went into the forest, 
found the people and killed them. So because this man spoke the truth, he took the reactions for the murders committee, for the atrocities committee. So we have to know how to apply religious principles. Lord Krishna spoke like this to Arjuna because at one point Yudhisthira had insulted Arjuna. He told Arjuna, you're not fit to carry that Kandiva bow. You should put down that Kandiva bow. And Arjuna had made a vow that he would kill anyone who told him to put down his Kandiva bow. And he drew his sword. He was ready to kill his brother Yudhisthira. But Krishna then explained to him that you have to know how to apply religious principles. You cannot kill your own brother. That is ridiculous. No. Lord Krishna then told him what he needed to do to keep his vow. Because Arjuna was saying, well, I've made a vow, I will kill anyone who tells me to put down my Gandiva bow. I made the vow, I have to keep my vow. So Krishna told him, all right, so there are other ways to kill him. You don't have to just simply kill him with your sword. You can kill him uh, by abuse, by abusive language, by insulting him. So in this way Arjuna hurled abuse at Yudhisthira. That you say you're my older brother, you claim you're our guardian, but you allowed our wife to be taken, you lost our wife in the gambling match, and you watched her be disrobed, and you wouldn't let me go and protect her. What kind of brother are you? You're not fit to be uh, our leader, our authority. And in this way, by Arjuna insulting Yudhisthira in this way, it was like killing him. And after saying these words, then Arjuna fell at the feet of Yudhisthira and begged forgiveness. <laughs> so in this way, he had kept his vow. He had killed him, but not actually. So, like that, we have to understand how to apply <clears throat> religious principles. Devotees are meant to speak the truth. We're meant to be truthful. We're meant to, but we have to speak the truth in such a way that it is always pleasing to others, that it is palatable. <laughs> there was an incident. Srila Prabhupada uh, had. Uh, a, a friendship with one lady who was the head of a shipping company called Sindhya Shipping Company. Many of you may know, after reading Lila Brita, how Prabhupada was given a passage on the Sindhya shipping line, on the Jaladutta. So that Jaladutta was owned by the Sindhya Shipping Company, and the head of that Sindhya Shipping Company was an elderly lady called Srimati Morariji. And she was uh, a follower of Balabhacharya. Now Balabhacharya is described in Chaitanya Charitamrita. He had met Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he was a friend of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Balabhacharya wrote very famous commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, Lord Chaitanya, when Lord Chaitanya had gone to Triveni, uh, at that time, Balabhacharya had come and he brought Lord Chaitanya to his home. Some of you may have gone there to Triveni. Near to Triveni, you can see Balabhacharya's house. It's still there today. There's a temple there. It's still there maintaining it. Very nice. And uh, you can understand Lord Chaitanya and Balabhacharya had a very intimate relationship. At that time, Balabhacharya was a grihasta. Later on it became sannyasi, but at that time when he brought Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya was a sannyasi and he brought him to his home and he honored him and treated him with great respect. And later on Lord Chaitanya was living in Jagannath Puri and Balabhacharya had come there to meet with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And uh, Balabhacharya had mentioned that he had written a commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam and he said that my commentary is surpassing that of Sridhar Swami. So Lord Chaitanya corrected him in this remark, telling him that one should not surpass the previous acharyas. That if 
Swami means also husband. If one is not chaste to the husband, if a woman is not chaste to the husband, the woman is a prostitute. So, in this way, Lord Chaitanya corrected Balabhacharya, telling him that you sh we should not try to surpass the previous Acharyas. It is like a wife being unchaste to the husband. So this passage is there in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. And this passage somehow became published in the Back to Godhead magazine. Now some people being followers and being very devoted to Balabhacharya were not happy to see this article in the Back to Godhead. And they told uh, Sumati Morariji about this article being in Back to Godhead. And he said, this is your fault. You sent this man to the West and he's putting this knowledge around about our Mahaprabhu because they refer to Balabhacharya as Mahaprabhu. So Prabhupada wrote to Ma, Ma, the Ma, Srimati Morariji and he told her, he said, I'm very sorry, you have to forgive my disciples. They do not know the etiquette. Satyam bruyat, priyam bruyat. That the truth should be spoken in a manner which is pleasing. So this is etiquette. That we must learn to speak the truth, but at the same time speak it in a manner which is pleasing. Not running other people down. Similarly, in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna mentions qualities of the mode of goodness. And he mentions about speaking words which are pleasing to others. That that is the nature of the mode of goodness. To speak words which are pleasing to others. It's very easy for us in this age of Kali Yuga to be influenced by the personality of Kali and to speak words which are just which are just nasty, which are just hurting and painful to others. And sometimes we even take pleasure in speaking uh, insulting words to others. This is not the mode of goodness. All of us want to cultivate the mode of goodness. From the mode of goodness comes happiness. From the mode of passion, Rajagun, will simply come distress. So it's very important for us as devotees, worshippers of Lord Krishna, that we associate with the mode of goodness. And we should be familiar with the symptoms of the mode of goodness. Speaking words which are pleasing is there for something, a habit which we should try to cultivate. Srila <coughs> Prabhupada at the same time says we must be truthful, but we have to speak the truth in such a way that people can accept it, not that they will feel threatened or challenged by it. Another good example of Srila Prabhupada exhibiting this this, uh, these qualities was on one occasion he was invited to a Rotary Club and he was asked to give a talk. This was in India, I think in Calcutta or Bombay, one, some big city. And Prabhupada spoke from Srimad Bhagavatam where uh, it is described that people who are like hogs, dogs, camels and asses praise other people of similar nature. Right? So Prabhupada was explaining to all the people there how everyone, modern the leaders of the world today are all on the level of hogs, dogs, camels and asses. And these were all Rotarians, they were all big men, big industrialists, <laughs> and they were listening to Prabhupada and they were not, and they were laughing also and they were appreciating. And Prabhupada, after the, after the talk, Prabhupada was laughing and confiding to the devotees. He said, you see, I called them all hogs, dogs, camels and asses and they were appreciating. They were saying, very good Swamiji. You have spoken very nicely. You know? So this is the expertise of the pure devotee. 
that they can speak in such a way, they will speak the truth, but at the same time it will be very pleasing. So they know how to use this knowledge, they know how to present it in a manner to make it acceptable for people. You know, taking a medicine, sometimes Krishna, this knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, sometimes it, it can be quite challenging for us. The different principles of devotion, you know, some, when we mention no meat, fish and eggs, no intoxication, no gambling, no this, no that, people feel, oh my goodness, so many rules. So we have to we have to learn to also sugarcoat it. You know, just like when you have a child and you have to give your children medicine, you know, you have to give them some sweet, you know, to take away the bitter taste. So similarly in presenting Krishna consciousness, we have to be truthful, we have to speak the truth. We don't want to compromise, but at the same time we want to make it very pleasing. We want that people will under, they will accept it. And Srila Prabhupada was, was very expert in that. He quoted Rupa Goswami that somehow or other get people attached to Krishna, attracted to Krishna, and gradually give them the rules and regulations. The, the first thing is that we should develop the attachment for Krishna. And Gradually, the rules and regulations can come. That is important for us in preaching Krishna consciousness. We want to cultivate relationships, loving relationships with people. We, have to, we want to show people that we are really caring, we are really concerned for them. And when we, when we give this knowledge to them, it is for their, for their gain, for their benefit. Sometimes people feel threatened, they feel challenged, that we're trying to change them. But actually we want to awake, bring them back to their original self. By nature, everyone is a devotee of Krishna. Love for Krishna is in everyone's heart. It just has to be awakened. People have to have the opportunity to hear. In Chaitanya Charakamrita, it is stated like that. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prem Sadya Kabunai Shravanadi Shuddha Chite Kurihi Udai. Love for Krishna is in everyone's heart. It is awakened by hearing. So we have to, we have to learn the art to speak the, the truth in such a manner that people will be interested that they will like to hear, they will want to hear, that we will, we will take pleasure in hearing topics of Krishna. Topics of Krishna uh, pleasing to those who are devotees. Of course, in the, this fourth chapter, Krishna has described Arjuna's qualification to hear the Bhagavad Gita, because he's a devotee as well as a friend. So that devotional aspect is there in everyone, we have, but we have, to, we have to nourish it, we have to fan it, we have to learn how to bring it to life that people can appreciate their devotion for Krishna. So this is transcendental knowledge. It is so powerful that even the sinful person can achieve perfection by having this transcendental knowledge. So this, this knowledge is so, so great. This, this knowledge, the, the mature fruit of all mysticism. So we want to develop this knowledge gradually, particularly through the process of devotional service. And the essential feature of devotional service is in chanting the holy name. It is said that Gorkishor Das Babaji Maharaj was practically illiterate. He, he could not write in, in his name. But he was fully realized in all the scriptures. He was fully realized in Vedic knowledge. Haridas Thakur was simply chanting the holy name. He was not a scholar. 
but he could answer any of the questions, any of the challenges which were placed to him by the so-called Brahmins, he could defeat them with his, with his realization of Vedic knowledge. So all of this knowledge comes about by chanting <laughs> the holy name of Krishna. It is said all of the Vedic knowledge is contained there in the 16 words of the Hare Krishna mantra. Simply by chanting the holy names of Krishna, we will get all the knowledge of the Vedic scriptures. Of course, it's stated that for one who has taken shelter, who has taken up the, the habit of chanting the holy names of the Lord, then it's understood that in his previous life, He's already studied all the scriptures. He's already visited all the holy places. He's already performed all kinds of penances and austerities and acquired all the good qualities of the Aryans. Otherwise, how else could he be able to chant the holy name? So this is the power of the holy name, that it brings us transcendental knowledge. But that chanting of the holy name also has qualities. To get the full benefit of the holy name, we have to chant the name with proper quality. The, there is offensive chanting, there is the clearing stage, and there is the pure chanting of the holy name. Haridas Thakur explained that it, even chanting on the stage of Namabhas one is liberated. But as devotees, we're not anxious for liberation. Liberation is already there for one who is chanting the holy name, one who is engaged in Krishna's service. Devotional service begins on the liberating platform. Liberation is not our goal. That's where we're beginning from. The goal of the devotee is love for Krishna. That is the real fruit of all mysticism, love of God. Not just simply transcendental knowledge, but actually Krishna Prem. Prem Punarto Maha. The goal of life is to de develop love for God. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has taught us this. We are not just simply working to get knowledge like some jnani yogi the jnanis are very eager to get liberation. But do jnanis advance very quickly? Krishna has explained, Bahunam Gyanmanamante Gyanavamam Prabhupadyanti. After many births and deaths, when one is actually in knowledge, then Vasudev Sarvamiti Samahatma It's very rare. So, by Jnana Yoga, we will progress very slowly, with great difficulty. In 12th chapter, Klesho Dekatara Stesya Avyakta Sakta Chetasam. Those who are attached to the unmanifested, the advancement comes very difficult, with great difficulty, great trouble. But for devotee, it's very easy. Ananya Chetasatatam Yomam Smriti. Ah, so Sulaba. I am very. It's very. I'm very easy to obtain for one who is engaged in my devotional service. So we should understand the merit, the real merit of bhakti yoga. This process is very easy. Krishna is very easy to obtain for the devotee, but very difficult by all other paths. The jnana yogi, many lives, struggling, very difficult, just to get liberation. And that liberation is also not secure. One will fall back again to the material world. Theoretical liberation. But for a devotee, they can get the real perfection. They can return to the abode of the Lord. So this is the proper understanding of bhakti yoga. What is the fruit of all transcendental knowledge is to engage in the service of Lord Krishna and to develop love for Lord Krishna, love of God. Then the life is successful. 
we want to get love for Krishna. We all have love, but we're giving this, our love to limited things. We're loving dog, we're loving car, we're loving country. We're so attached to the mundane. We have to give our love to the unlimited, to the Supreme Lord, Krishna. Then only our propensity to love is fulfilled. When we give our love to finite objects, we will not be satisfied. You love your family, family will never be satisfied. No matter how much you give, how, many, how nice a home you give them, how much money you provide for the, the child will always say, I want more, give me more. They're never satisfied, we know. This is the nature of the material world. It doesn't matter how hard we try to give love, to one person, they will never be satisfied. But when we give love to Krishna, then the loving relationship is fulfilled. So this is the position. We must give our love for Krishna. And then everyone is satisfied, because every living entity is part and parcel of Krishna. Then we can feel the true relationship with the Lord through yoga. Hare Krishna. Okay, any questions? Yes, Prabhu? Yes. How to love Krishna and how to start love Krishna? How to love Krishna? Will love means service. Yes. If the wife is sitting at home, and the husband comes home from work, and you come home from work and you see your wife sitting there, and the house is all dirty, and there's no food prepared, and the children are not doing their homework, and the children are running around in dirty clothing, and you ask your wife, what's going on? What's happening here? And the wife says, Oh, I'm just thinking how much I love you. <laughs> so the husband will say, what? You love me? Why don't you cook for me? Why don't you clean the house? Why don't you do the laundry? Why don't you take care of the children? What kind of love is this? Love means service. Right? If, when we speak of love for Krishna, we show that love through service. Therefore, we speak of bhakti yoga, devotional service. Not just simply serving out of duty, but serving out of love. Lovi lovingly, willingly, eagerly serving the Lord. This is real love. When we are actually serving the Lord with enthusiasm, constantly, Therefore, devotional service is described as being a haitiki and apratiyata, right? Unmotivated. We're not, ser we're not serving just to get reward. Just how much will you pay me? What will you give me? And our service is not spor sporadic. It is, you know, like they have these convenience stores. They never close. 7, 24, right? 24, 7. So our devotion to Krishna, love for Krishna, should be like that. Without material motivation and constantly, continuously, with great enthusiasm. This is love. Love for Krishna. And of course Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has taught us the chanting of the Holy Name is the best service for the Lord. Chanting, kirtani yasadahari, always chant, and chant with quality, with feelings, calling for the Lord. So the chanting is a prayer for service, and it's also the answer to the prayer. Because by chanting the Lord's name, we are being engaged in His service. So this is love. We show that love through service. We bring the Lord here in the deity form so that we can serve Him. God is a Krishna is a person and He appears in the form of the deity. We serve the deity. 
by dressing him, bathing him, offering cooking for him, offering foodstuffs to him, cleansing the temple, and then also speaking from the scriptures and singing bhajans and songs for his pleasure. Everything is done for his pleasure. This is love. What, what should be a mood of devotee while chanting the Hare Krishna mantra? Srila Prabhupada explains the mood of the devotee should be like a child calling for the parents. When the child is separated from the mother or the father, it's only the parents who are going to stop the child from crying. So in the same way, in our chanting, we should have the feeling that we simply want Krishna. We, we want to, uh, we're calling to Krishna. We're praying to him, please engage me in your service. And by, of course, by chanting his name, we are also serving him. We're hearing the, the holy name is entering our hearts. Because the name enters our heart, then it conquers the activities of the mind. And all, all the senses become inert. So, the, uh, in calling the name, the, it, it, we should understand also that, that the name of the Lord is not different from the Lord. That, should, that is at the higher stage in chanting, to know that there is no difference between the Lord's name and the Lord as a person. Kali Kali Namarupe Krishna Avatar. The Lord appears in this age in the form of His holy name. So we should understand like that when we chant. Yeah? Uh, Sometimes uh, we want to tell something, the truth, and also lovingly. But uh, we want to tell lovingly, but it has got uh, other way reaction. So it's better to tell or not to tell? How we should approach the man? Suppose better to tell the truth or better not to tell the truth? Well, we have, to un we have to judge according to time and circumstances. Sometimes it may be wise to speak the truth, and sometimes it may be wise, better just to keep quiet. We can judge by the result, right? <laughs> you have to see. <laughs> of course, you don't know what result. You have to be cautious where we speak, who we speak the truth to. Yeah. You don't want to get yourself into trouble. If you're, if you're preaching, all your efforts and service to Krishna are disturbed by speaking the truth, then you haven't done any good. You haven't done yourself any good. So everything must be considered time, place, and circumstances. In this country particularly, we have to be very careful how we speak, how we act. Prabhupada was asked, for example, if we see someone suffering, someone drowning in the sea, or maybe they're in a fire, and should we try to save them? Is it our duty to try to save them? So Prabhupada ex said, said, actually, he said, we, we don't have any duty towards them. It's their karma. We, you know, we shouldn't really interfere with an individual's karma. But then Prabhupada explained, but there's another side. You have to consider also public opinion. And if we are known to be callous and hard-hearted and not caring for others, then this will be a very bad opinion for people who go against the Krishna consciousness movement and criticize devotees. So we should understand how to act in such a manner that people appreciate Krishna consciousness. Just like one time in Australia, there was a fire and the devotees were nearby and they came, they brought some sheets and they held out sheets and the people jumped off the building into the sheets. And the devotees saved the lives of several people. And it came in the newspaper that Hare Krishna devotees saved the lives. And so Prabhupada said, this is very good, very good publicity for Krishna consciousness. But 
is that actually philosophically we have no right really interfering in people's karma. <laughs> <laughs> But we, the higher opinion, the higher on the higher sense, we are thinking about the public opinion. And if you get public opinion on the side of Krishna, then that's very good. So we have to consider the thing very carefully. Everything, time, place, circumstance. <coughs> Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much.